in most years, the day of Chof Menachem Av, the 20th day of the month of Av, occurs in the week of Parshas Ekev. Sometimes it will also come out in the week of Parsha Re'e, in the first two, three days of next week's Parsha, Parsha Re'e. But as the Zohar says, Shabbos minay mizbarch in kulo yomin. All the coming days are anyways blessed from Shabbos. So the day of Chof Av is generally connected to the Parsha of Ekev. What happened on Chof Av, on the 20th day of Av? The Rebbe's father, the Lubavitch Rebbe's father, Harav Agoyen, Harav Achosid, Vamukubel, Reb Lev Yitzchak Schneerson, he passed away. He was in Golos, he was in exile because he was a big Rav. And those days, unfortunately, in Russia with the KGB, they used to take Rabbanim and put them to jail and many times uh, either kill them or send them out to, uh, to exile. And he actually went for five years to Kazakhstan and that is where he died and that is where he is actually buried until today. And the Rebbe Levi Yitzchok, we're not going to go through his life story because there are three volumes of Toldos Levi Yitzchak, which describe his basic life story. And I'm sure that there was plenty more that, that went on. And uh, Rebbe Levi Yitzchok was a very, very, very big mekubal. He knew a lot of Kabbalah that he was able to take the shot of the Pusik and explain it through Kabbalah in a very simple way. And as a matter of fact, there are a whole bunch of Sfarim of Likuti Levi Yitzchak that came out. These are on the Zohar. These are on uh, the different letters between the Rebbe and him. And it's interesting that most of this was written when he was out there in the exile, where he had no food, no Sfarim, nothing. And it's amazing to see how he did this all from memory, from cup after being tortured. And he didn't have a pen. And uh, we discussed in another shir the whole story of Chafavar Velev Yitzchak. But his mother, the Rebbe Tzanchana, she used to go and from herbs, she made ink and she brought him from the house. She went to meet him in his exile in Kazakhstan, in uh, Chile, in Almata. And uh, she brought him a Zohar because she knew that this is one of the Sfarim that he cherishes, and a Tanya of the Alter Rebbe. And the Reblevik wrote on the sides of the Tanya and of the Zohar, and the original manuscripts are in the Rebbe's library on display. Unbelievable, you could see all the different colors on the sides. And then throughout the years, on Shabbos, when the Rebbe used to fabrink, he used to take one of the pieces of his father's writing, a line or two lines, and he would expound on it. And then we have a few Sfarim which are called Teiras Menachem, Tif Eres Levi Yitzchak, which over here, they have the explanations of the Rebbe, part of them obviously, just a small, small amount of them, explanations of the Rebbe on his father's writing. So it, it's a sheer for itself, as we explained many times, issues in Kabbalah, how Rebbe Levi Yitzchak explains them. We have a sheer on the first Mishnah in uh, Shas. Um, the three opinions there. Why are the three opinions? Why is it Rabbi Leze? Why is it Rabbi Gamliel? Why is it the Chachamim? In that order. Unbelievable um, explanation from Rabbi Levi Yitzchak on that. And um, there is a very interesting Shaloh. The Shaloh HaKadosh says that um, the, uh, the uh, holidays Hanukkah, Purim, Pesach, Shavuos are in specific dates. Hanukkah is in the month of uh, of uh, Kislev, Purim is in Oder, Pesach is in Nisan, Tishabov is in uh, Av. We also read the parishes always approximately in that same time. So the parasha that we read next to a Yom Tev has a connection. He says that in Parsha Vayeshev, Parsha Vayeshev and Miketz are connected to Hanukkah. If you look good in the Parsha of, ha of Vayeshev and Miketz, you will see a connection to Hanukkah. If you look in the Parsha of, uh, of uh, Dvarim, which is the Shabbos before Tisha B'av, you will see the connection to Dvarim. Besides for the very open connection that Shani starts, Eicho Es Alevadi, etc. But in the Toichen, in the explanation of the Parsha, there is a connection to the Yom Tev, which happens around those days. And this, the, the, the Rebbe explained in many Fabrengans that this is also when it comes to the dates of the yard sites of Rabbeim or uh, the day they were born, that there's a connection between that Parsha and that yard site. If I may just uh, share just one concept, one little story with, uh, with Reb Leivik of after he passed away, after his Estalkus, there was a Jew who lived here in Crown Heights in his last years. His name was Reb Yosef Nimoitin. This Reb Yosef, after the Rebbe's father passed away in 1944 in Tavshin Dalid, he lived in Alma Ata, in the place where Reb Leivik passed away. The uh, Chassidim used to call him Reb Leivik. Reb Leiv Yitzchak, in short, Reb Leivik. And he, um, he used to watch the 
Oyhel, the place where the Rebbe Yitzchak passed away, the caver. It, unfortunately, the cemetery is, uh, is not one of the best places. This was an exile. And people from all over Russia used to send to this Rebbe Yosef request that they should go to the grave of Rebbe Levi Yitzchak to daven for them. There was a Fabrenium where the Rebbe one time mentioned that when the previous Rebbe left Russia, so for those of you who know that it was, it was called the Iron Curtain, the people from the Chassidim from Russia, they wanted to be in touch with the previous Rebbe, it was almost impossible. And if they ever found Chas Shalom, a letter between a Chassid and the Rebbe, ooh, you deal with the outside of the country, you are a revolutionary and everything. So when Chassidim wanted to go to the Oyal of Atzadik and they couldn't go to Rastov, they couldn't go to the place of the Rebbe Rashab or to Lubavitch, they would send to Rebbe Levi Yitzchak. And I believe that the Rebbe even mentioned that to a certain extent the Rabbeistve, the Admuris, also went over in Russia. People looked at Rebbe Levi Yitzchak as the address. And this Rebbe Yosef used to say many stories, a lot of them are already printed in this Toldos Levi Yitzchak, but two that uh, stand out a little that I remember. <coughs> he said that one time someone sent him a uh, letter that he should ask uh, Rebbe Levi for a bracha, a refuah shalema for somebody. He said that whenever he used to go to the cave of Revlevik, he never used to write down a pidyon and then put it on. He says he always used to talk. He used to talk to the, to the cave. And he used to call Revlevik, Tatinke Rebinke. That's how he used to say, Tatinke, my father, Rebinke, Rebbe. And he would say, Tatinke, Rebinke, this and this person needs help. And uh, there was this time that he was going to ask for this person. He went to the cave and, and he wants to say a few words. It's not coming out. So he stepped right away back. Then he went again. And all of a sudden, the words aren't coming out. So he went back. The third time, and the words aren't coming out. So <clears throat> he decided, okay, tomorrow he'll come back and he'll uh, ask. At night, he got a call from the person who asked him to go to the cave and ask for a bracha. He said, I hope you didn't go to ask for a bracha. He says, why not? He says, because the person unfortunately already passed away. So here he saw Rabbi Yosef, he says he saw, I'm dealing over here with a tzaddik out of this world. But then there was another interesting anecdote, that one time he finally went over to the Blavik, this was in the later years, and he says, Tatinke Rebinke, loves missionaries from Fondan, and he wants to go away from here. He wants to go to America, he wants to be able to go and finally see the Rebbe once and for all. And he told the Reblevik that he's going to do this and that. And at the end he said, and then I'm going to ask your son, I'm going to ask the Rebbe, Farvas is a nishgi vendor, Farvas is a nishgi kumen. Why wasn't he ever here? This is what he said to himself that he, that he told the Reblevik. Fine. Sure enough, he managed to leave Russia. He came to the Rebbe and he told the Rebbe a whole bunch of stories, one story, another story. And then he said, but he didn't have the hearts. He didn't have the, 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 the guts, the, the, the heart to tell the Rebbe, that I also told uh, the Rebbe Levik that I was going to ask the Rebbe why he was never here. Uh, he stopped. He basically said those stories. And all of a sudden, the Rebbe turns to him and says, But didn't you also say that you're going to ask me why you didn't come here? He said he was, that, that's it. He, he didn't need anything more than that. This is just two tiny little anecdotes, which I should remember. But there is plenty, plenty more to talk about the Blavik. And I must say that uh, Baruch Hashem, I have the schus that I'm named after the Levi Yitzchak. And as a matter of fact, in my first Yichidus, my first audience with the Rebbe, which was a special one because it was in the afternoon, which I discussed that already once regarding the name Levi Yitzchak, that after the Rebbe asked him, what's my name? And the Rebbe heard me, he asked me questions on what I learned in Chumash. And uh, the last question the Rebbe asked me, Unoch vemem bistu anomen, and who are you named after? And I remember that I was questioning in Italian, I know how to say you're in an uh, honorable way, but I didn't know how to say it in Yiddish exactly. And finally I just said, The Rebbe Stata. The Rebbe gave me a broad smile and he gave me a Siddur. So I have a schus that I'm named Levi Yitzchak. So as we mentioned before, as the Shalos says that there's definitely a connection between the Parsha and the Yardzeit. So let's go into our Parsha and Parsha Ekev and let's see where it talks about Yardzeit. And we're going to have an unbelievable insight into the concept of a Yardzeit, obviously, the way <coughs> the Rebbe explains it. And this is in Lekut HaSichas Chelik Yud Dalet, Lekut HaSichas volume 14, pages 30 through 36, and of course other places. We're going to start with the Yerushalmi, 
and then we will go into the Pasuk in the Parsha. The Yerushalmi is the source for the Rashi that we are going to do. So therefore, let's start with the Yerushalmi. Look in your curriculum, number one, <coughs> quote number one. The Yerushalmi says as follows, the Yerushalmi is in Yuma, Perik Aleph, Halacha Aleph. And the Yerushalmi asks a question. In this week's parasha, we have two stories that we are going to discuss very soon. One story is where Moshe Rabbeinu talks about, he tells the Yidin what happened when he came down with the Luchas, with the tablets, and he saw that the Yidin are doing the eagle, so he broke them, they were doing the golden calf, so he broke the luchas, and then later how Hashem told him to make another set of luchas, which is called the luchas shniyas. We have the luchas rishonas, the first ones, and then we have the luchas shniyas, the second one. Right after that, the Torah talks about the passing of Aharon HaKohen. That's what happens in our parsha. So look, let's look at Yerushalmi. Yerushalmi asks, Why does the Rebbe and the Torah connect? Put in proximity the passing of Aaron to the breaking of the Luchas. And says the, 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 the Yerushalmi, to teach you that the passing away of Tzadikim, the passing of a Tzadik is hard for the Ebishter, like the breaking of the Luchas. This is what the Yerushalmi says. Let's look in the parish exactly how this works, what exactly this means. So let's go to quote number two. Parsha Seinu in Parsha Ekev Peidik Yud Pasuk Aleph. Says the Pasuk as follows. Bo Eisahi at that time, Moshe Rabbeinu is talking obviously. He says, Omar Hashem Eli, the Rebishta told me this was after the story of the eagle that the Yidden did the golden calf. The Rebishta says, Psallacha Shnei Luchay Savonim Karishonim. Carve out for yourself two tablets, two luchas, like the first ones, come back to me up on the mountain, and make also a ark, a box, a box of wood. And I'm going to write on the luchas, on the tablet, the same words that were on the uh, first tablets, Asher Shibarto, that you broke, the Samtom Ba'orim, and Ba'orin, and then you should put them into the box, into the Orin. Pasu Gimel, Moshe Rabbeinu continues, Va'as Aroin, I'm Takemeida Aroin, Va'efsel Shnei Luches, there's a whole bunch of words in between, but I'm just saying the basic point, Va'efsel Shnei Luches, and I carved out two Luches, Va'yichtoi Vala Luches, and the Rebish, they wrote on the Luches the same words, Va'ered Minahar, then I came back down, and then I put the luchas in that orin asher osisi which I made. This is the basic story that Moshe Rabbeinu is telling the Yid. Next pasuk, pasuk vav, comes the Torah and says, "Uvnei Yisrael nos umi beiris bnei Yaakov Moiseira," and the Yid traveled from beiris bnei Yaakov to Moiseira. Sham meis Aaron vaykaber sham, and over there Aaron passed away and was buried. Comes Rashi, you can look at your quote number three. Ma'inyan zelakan. What does this have to do over here? Something doesn't make sense here. The Yidden broke the Rebbe. Moshe Rabbeinu broke the luchas. This was in Har Sinai. The pasuk all of a sudden says that they went from Be'eres Ben Yakin to Moshe and Aaron passed away. Aaron passed away after the the uh, luchas were broken. The luchas were broken the first year they went out of Mitzrayim. Aaron passed away forty years later. What's going on over here? Says Rashi, my Indian Zelakan, what does this have to do over here? The Oid, and then Rashi asks another question. The Oid, and they ask a third question. It's a very long Rashi. I'm just bringing the, only the point which is negated to us. Asks Rashi, the Oid, Sham Mesaren. Aaron passed away over there in Mesaren. The Haloi Behid Hormes. He passed away in Hoid Hahar, not in, as we learned in the previous parishes, in my Pasha Masai. So, what is going on over here? So Rashi goes over here a whole long arichas about uh, a long explanation about the rebuke that Moshe Rabbeinu told the Yidden, and Rashi ends off like this: Moshe Rabbeinu connected this reprimand, this rebuke, to the Yidden to the breaking of the luchas. Why? Loimar to say that the passing away of tzaddikim is hard for the Ebishter like the day that the luchas were broken so we see over here that the concept of the breaking of the luchas and the concept of a tzaddik passing away are compared to each other that's what Rashi says like we said before in the Yerushalmi and the question is what's the connection? It's true, a passing away of a tzaddik is a terrible thing. 
Breaking of the luchas is a terrible thing. So this is terrible and this is terrible. But just because there are two terrible things, there must be some connection when the Torah sommach, when the Torah puts two things connected to each other, there must be a connection in Torah in essence between the two. Not because this is terrible and this is terrible. A person who is Rahmanis, he has one tzara, another tzara. No, no, no. This is not what we're talking about. When the Torah puts two things in proximity, what's the essence? So breaking the luchas and a tzaddik passing away is the exact same kind concept. What is it? Now, so far it looks kosher, that this thing is so terrible, the breaking of the luchas at Misa Batzadik. When we look in, in the history, obviously in the Torah, we will see that the breaking of the luchas, not only it wasn't a bad thing, but according to something that we're going to learn in a few minutes, it'll turn out that there was nothing better. There was such a great thing, such a good thing, the breaking of the luchas. And we'll have to understand, wait a minute, is it something good or is it something bad? Where do we see the greatness of the breaking of the luchas? There's a whole thing. What did they do with this broken luchas? Moshe Rabbeinu put it in a box. What did they do with this box? Now, I'm not going to go now into the whole thing, where this box was. Did they put the broken luchas in the, together with the regular luchas in the regular oven? That's another whole sikha that we're going to be discussing at a different time. Right now, the way the story is here, there's a box that has the broken luchas. What did they do with this orin with the broken luchas? Look at your quote number four. There's a pasuk before in Parsha Ba'alois Chopei Rekut Pasuk Lamed Gimel. Says the Torah as follows. Vayis umei har Hashem derech shloishes yomim. The Yidden traveled from Har Hashem, from the mountain of the Rebishter. Three days. The trip that takes three days. Va'aroin bris Hashem hoylich lifnehem. And the orin of bris Hashem, the orin with the luchas goes in front of them. Losur lohem menucha. To find for them a place where they could rest. Says Rashi, what kind of oren is this? What kind of box is this? Says Rashi, This is the oren that goes with the Yidden to war. Which luchas are in there? The broken luchas. Let's analyze this for a moment. The Yidden are going to war and what goes in front of them? The, 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 the big general that's going in front of them. The broken luchas. Let's try to understand this. Wait a minute. Look in your quote number five. Parsha Kisisa. Parsha Kisisa was the famous story of the eagle. So in Peri, Klamet Beis, Pasu Klamet Dalet, what does the Rebish to say after the whole story with the eagle, with the golden calf? Says the Rebish there, Uveyoim Pakdi, Ufokadati Aleim Chatoisam. What does it mean? Uveyoim Pakdi. On the day when the Rebish to will punish the Yidden for their sins, for other sins, whatever they may be, I will remember also that Cheto Egel, that sin that they did with the, with the golden calf. Says Rashi, what does this mean? Says Rashi, in your quote number five, Tomit, always, whenever I'm going to have to take care of the Yidden because of their sins, I'm going to put on a little bit of the Chet, of the sin of the Egel, add it to it, you know, add it to the package. The aim put on is Bal Yisrael, and there is never a negative that comes on the Yidden. She aim boxas mi piroin avein ha eagle. That the Rebbe doesn't put in there also a little bit from the chet of the eagle. So we see that the, the, the concept just of remembering the chet to eagle is already a big problem. What are they going to war with? The broken luchas? Then what do they remember? The eagle. Let's continue, it's not finished. Look in your quote number six. Later in Pasha Kisaitz, in another few weeks, what are we going to learn? He says, When you're going, the Rebishta tells the Yidden, when you're going to go to war, you shall be careful from any negative things. Be careful. Says Rashi, what does it mean, you should be careful from any bad things? Says Rashi, because this is a Rashi also in, earlier in Bereshis. We're not going to get into that right now. The Sotan. Is mekatrik b'shas asakono. When someone is in danger, the sultan comes and starts prosecuting, starts telling Hashem, mm, "The person is in danger." You know, this person did. Aha! Uh -huh. You know what the rabbi, what he, this person did. Who knows when? And he starts prosecuting because the person now is in a sakona. Says Rashi and the Torah, when the Yidden go to war, going to war is a sakono, is a danger. They have to be careful not to do anything which can be negative. Why? Because chas v'shalom in the middle of a war to mention something negative. <laughs> we just said, what do they go with the war? Right in front, the Oren with what? With the Shivra Luchas. That talks about what? What the Yidden did with the Eagle. Uh, this whole thing makes absolutely no sense. Let's continue further. Look at the quote number seven. 
In Parsha Shoftim, this is also in another few weeks, in Perik Chav, Pasuk Chez, over there it talks about when the Yidin are getting ready to go to a war. What do we do then? Comes the Koyen, and he gives a whole speech together with the Shaitrim, that if somebody um, uh, built a house, it's the first year, go home. If somebody just got married, go home, etc. Then comes the last announcement. What is the last announcement? The Yosfu HaShaitrim will daber la'om. The Shaitrim, they will add this following last announcement to the people, the Omru, and they'll say as follows. If there's someone who is afraid, who is weak, a weak heart, he should go back home. Don't go to war. Why? And he shouldn't make other people also. He shouldn't be contagious to the others. If you're afraid, just go home. Says Rashi, what does it mean he's afraid? What is he afraid of? Brings Rashi, Rabbi Yosi Aglili Oimer, Hayore me Aveires Shebe Yode. Someone who is afraid from the Aveires that he has in his baggage. So somebody who had Aveires doesn't go to war. And the, the, the Gemara has a whole thing, what kind of Aveires, even a tiny little Aveires, like Soch bin Tfila le Tfila, which could mean either that he spoke between Tfil and Shalyad and Tfil and Shal Rosh, or he spoke between uh, Yishtabach and Kikriya Shema, etc. Even an Aveires like that. Stay home, please. We don't, we don't need these type of people. So, here we're being careful with the tiniest Aveda. And here, who goes in front of the Yidden when they need special schuzim? The broken luchas, which what do they remember? What do they remind? The breaking of the eagle. And uh, the, the making of the eagle. And the Rebbe just says that whenever anything goes wrong, he'll add on the baggage, the Chato Eagle. This whole thing, this is Klepnish, doesn't make sense. Continue further, quote number eight. The Balaturim over there in Kiseite, what does he say? Balaturim asks a question over there where he talks about going to war. Kiseite Lamel Chomo says the Balaturim like this. The Parsha before Kiseite is Parsha Shoftim. The last Pasig in Parsha Shoftim says, Vehosiso Hayosher Vehatoiv. You should do the correct thing. The next Parsha is Kiseite Lamel Chomo Levechom. When we go to war, ask the Balaturim. What's the connection? Going out to war to doing the right thing. Says the Balaturim, he puts them one next to each other. That who goes to war? Only the Tzadikim. So we see from all of this that going to war only Tzadikim go. And who, why? Because we have to be careful from the tiniest negative aspect. What goes in front? The luchas with the broken luchas. Aha! This is how we're going to win. Can't be. So we must say that the broken luchas have such a big mile, such a big advantage. And we have to understand what it is. By the way, they say that in Lodge, uh, the, the Lodge was a... Here, the Ambi Yisrael was a, had a big rov, Rebbe Lechaim Meisel's from Lodge. And unfortunately, you also had the people who were not so uh, into things. And there was a theater, the Yiddish Theater, the Kino. And uh, over there, things were not exactly in the tighter way, and sometimes they used to make a little bit of fun. So one time, obviously it wasn't, it wasn't out of bad, they just didn't have the chance to learn when they were young, and so they didn't know. It was, it was more ignorance than that. And they say that some of the Yidden came to Rebbe Lechaim Meisels, who was a Rav. By the way, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak got smiche from Rebbe Lechaim Meisels from Lodge. So they came to him and said, Rebbe Lechaim, we have a big problem. The theater just made fun of Yiddishkeit. Why did they make fun? <laughs> they made a whole play in the theater of how the Yidden are getting ready to go to war. No, so all the Yidden are getting ready to go to Imagine Yiddelach going to war. No, so here we see the Kohen say, standing there and saying, um, uh, if somebody built a house, go. And you see this guy who had this chatkele, this, this little uh, <laughs> shack, he's going home because he built a house. <laughs> and one after another. Then finally they say, whoever has any Avedas, go home. So the whole place empties out. Who stays? Two people. Who is it? The Shagasarye and the Neid of Yehuda. Two great sages. They for sure have no Avedas. So now we're going to war. Who? With two soldiers. The Shagasarye and the Neid of Yehuda. This is what Jewish wars looked like. This was the basic concept of the play of the theater. And everybody laughed. It was funny. The Belechaim, in all seriousness, he turns around to these Jews and says, Excuse me, who do you think went to war? The Shagasari and the Yehuda, nobody else. This was the fact. You could imagine what a Jewish war looked like. Only the tzaddikim that don't have any, but, but this is the fact. Okay. So the Shaila is, why did they take 
the, um, the broken luchas. So there must be something givaldic about the broken luchas. And then we will see what's so givaldic about the yard site because we're putting together the misa tzaddikim to the breaking of the luchas. So, to make a long story short, the Rebbe explains it as follows. Let's analyze the luchas. Let's Pasha, take the physical luchas. What were they? What was it? Look at your quote number nine. In Parshat Yisisa, in Perik Lamed Beis, Pasuk Tez Zayin, over there the Torah says that the Rebbe they gave to Meishe Rabbeinu Luchas, and the Torah says this expression. Let's look at this carefully. Ve'haluchas ma'asei elikim heima. The luchas were a work of the Eibishter of God. Ve'hamichtav and the writing on the luchas, michtav elikim hu, a writing a of the Eibishter, a calligraphy of the Eibishter, chorus ala luchas, engraved in the luchas. So we have two concepts here. First, the luchas are ma'asei elikim, a work of the Eibishter. And then we have also the writing on the luchas. Let's analyze what does this mean, ma'ase elikim, a work of the Abishta. What is this? Go to your quote number 10. There's a beautiful medrash. The medrash in Yalkut Shemoni in Parsha Kisisa, in the Remez Shin Tzadik Beis, says the Yalkut Shemoni as follows. The Pasuk says that the luchas are a work of the Abishta. Says the Yalkut, haluchas lenivru min ha'aretz. The luchas were not created from physical earth, from the, la from the earth. Elo mina shamayim. They came from heaven. Could you imagine? There's a physical object. Where did it come from? It came from shamayim. Everything here on earth is physical. This is the, the paper. Comes from wood. The wood comes from the uh, ground. The wood was created in the six days. Yeah, it's all part of the Adam, of, 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 of the creation. All of a sudden, the Rebbe had to give luchas. He sent down from heaven a set of luchas. Ma'asei alikim, says the Medrash. Then the Medrash continues. Ukeshe Omar loy hamokim psalachom. And the Rebbe had told Moshe Rabbeinu to do the second luchas. Oh, mechzef shesamperinu nivro le Moshe betoi chaholoi vechotzvei. So then the Rebbe had in the tent of Moshe Rabbeinu, he put over there a, 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 a big stone, and Moshe Rabbeinu had to carve out that stone, and from that he made the luchas. But the first luchas, they were ma'asei alikim, something that came from, as they say in, in English, out of this world. Pashat, ma'asei alikim, it came from above, as the minashamayim, out of this world. Not only that, if we go a little further, we look in Tanya from the Alter Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe in Tanya Perik and Gimel, in your quote number 11, says the Alter Rebbe, I'm not going to go now through the whole explanation why the Alter Rebbe brings it, in Perik, it's, it's the end, last Perik of the first, Chelek uh, in Tanya, says the Alter Rebbe, the, uh, the, Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe is talking there about the ten Dibres, which are engraved in the Luchos, that they were in the Oroin, and they were miraculous, says the Alter Rebbe, this was a work of the Abishtin, and Alter Rebbe continues, this is something that came directly down from Olam Habriya. Those of you who are a little familiar with Hasidus, you know that there are four worlds, Atzilus, Briya, Yetzira, Asiya. Asiya is the lowest, where our physical world, then above us there's Olam Asiya Haruchnis, that's the, the, the spiritual Asiya, then we have Yetzira, then we have Briya, that's where the Malachim are, etc., the Kisyakovit. Over there, the Abishtin made Haluchas, and he sent it down. A human mind cannot grasp what this means. Bottom line says it that this is a physical luchas. This is the highest thing ever possible to imagine in Eilam Hazem. No, Moshe Rabbeinu received this unbelievable luchas. What does he do with them? Let's look in the sources. What does he do with this unbelievable concept? Look at your quote number 12. This is taken from Aves de Rabnasen. Aves de Rabnasen is when you take your Shas, your Talmud, the end of Nezikin, the end of the order of Nezikin, the last Mesechtas that are known usually in the Shas, or Heirias, uh, Edias, Aves, Mesechta Aves. Right after Mesechta Aves, you have what is called Aves de Rabnasen. I'm not going to go now into the concept of the small Mesechtas, but that is where it is. So in Ovis de Rabnosin, it says as follows. The quote number 12, Ovis de Rabnosin, Peirik Beis, in the second chapter, he says as follows. The Luchas were a Masa They were a work of the Ebishtim. 
So the Medrash, uh, the, the Ovis, the Rabnosan goes a whole story exactly what happened. It's fascinating. Bomesh Rabinu got the Luchas and how he came down and when he saw the Egil and what he did, and then this Kanim Kayas. Says the Medrash as follows. The, the Ovis, the Rabnosan as follows. Not long, Moish Rabinu took these Luchas, and he came down. He was in an unbelievable happiness, joy, ecstasy. However, he came down with the luchas and kiv and shero oise sirchain shesar chu b'maso eigel. And when he saw this negative, this was a pastnished with the story of the eigel. Omar, so he said, Hey, Echani Neisen Lohem Esaluchos, how in the world can I give to the Yidden these Luchos? I have in my hands the most precious object possible, but how can I give it to the Yidden? And he continued in the Luchos, it says, Lo Yilachoy Lekim Achairim. In this Luchos it says, you're not allowed to have any idol worships. And all of a sudden, here they have uh, an eagle. How am I get? It's just not going to work. And then a whole story over there with this Kanim. Finally, the obvious that the Skanim grabbed, wanted to grab, so much that I've been grabbed it back. It's a kiton. So finally comes the obvious that I've not and says, Nistakel Bohan, Moshe Rabbeinu looked at the Luchas, and all of a sudden he saw something very interesting. Vero, and he saw Sheparach Sav Me'alehen. He's holding these beautiful Luchas, work of the Abishtin. Carved out the hand, right? The 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 Ksav, the, uh, hand, the the writing over there was written by the Abishtin. And what did he see? Sheparach Sav Me'alehen. He saw that the writing flew back up. He's standing now with Luchas, but without the writing. Omar, so he said, How can I give to the Yidin Luchas She'ein Bohem Mamish? That they are totally worthless. Wayne Bohem Mamish, they're worthless. So he has no other choice. Elo Echois, he grabbed them. And I'm going to break them, and that's exactly what he did. So there's a lot of questions on this, but we're just going to ask two of them. The first question is, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Ein Bohem Mamish. These luchas, the moment the letters went up, Ein Bohem Mamish. They are worthless. They're nothing worth. What are you talking about they're nothing worth? Let's take a simple example. A person buys for his wife this beautiful bracelet, golden bracelet, heavy gold. And on top of it, there's a diamond. It goes by a few uh, while, and all of a sudden, they lose the diamond. They lose the diamond, but the bracelet is still there. Is the bracelet still worth something? Of course, the bracelet, the whole gold, what are you talking about? The diamond was something added to it. Hey, you lost the diamond, of course, the diamond makes it even more worth. But the moment I lose the diamond, it doesn't mean that I also lost the gold. Maish Rabinu says, no, no, I have two things here. I have the luchas and I have the ksav. Right? Haluchas masi likim eima and vamichtav michtav elikimhu. Says Moshe Rabbeinu, the moment I lose the writing, the moment I lose the michtav elikim, the writing, the luchas ain't bohem mamish, they're worthless. What do you mean they're worthless? There's still something that came from Oilam Abriya. Okay, so he doesn't have the letters, it's worthless. But ain't bohem mamish, they are worthless. Nothing. Why? And not only that, no, let us say that for whatever reason, ain't bohem mamish, so he didn't have to break it. He could either give it back to the Abishtin. He could uh, bury it. He could do something. Ashabrim, you had to break them to show that this is worthless, garnished. How could that be? Obviously, there must be something over here that if we don't have the letters, finished. Gendik, there's nothing there. The answer, very, very simple is, for anybody who learned a little bit of Chassidus, knows that there's a very big difference between Oisius HaKsiva and Oisius HaKakika. There are letters that we write and there are letters that we carve. In a Sefer Teure, we have the parchment, we have ink, we write the letters, and now we have a holy Sefer Teure. However, we can scratch out the letter, and all of a sudden we're back to the original, to the parchment, and now we can write another word. So the letters and the parchment, although they are connected, there are two things which are connected, but it's not one thing with the parchment. It didn't become me'uched in the expression of Chassidus. It didn't become unified. When we go to carved letters, like we have in the Luchas, Oisies HaChakiko, oh, now the letters and the Luchas become one thing. 
It's not two separate things, it's one thing. Now, and, and based on this, we can understand that it's not that the physical letters went up. The luchas remained exactly the same. When it says, Vamichtov, Michtav Elikimu, that the Rebishter wrote, this was a Ruchnius Dike thing, it was a spiritual thing that went, just like we have a body and a, and a, a, a guf and a nisham, a body and a soul. The soul you don't see. But the moment the soul goes out, the body dies. The same thing here with the luchas. The, if the letters were something that were written, yeah, we could put some more. So the, because the letters are separate from the from the original. When they are part of it, the luchas and the letters become one thing. And therefore comes Moshe Rabbeinu and says, hey, no, 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 no. The moment the neshama, the soul of the luchas left, ain't bahem mamish, it's worthless. It's not the pshat that first they have one big mile, which they are, one big advantage that they are Maisel Ekim. And then comes another advantage, which they are Michtav Elikim. So now when they lost the Michtav Elikim, when they lost the handwriting, so now they go back to Maisel Ekim. No, the moment they went on a higher level, in Teireh there is no such thing as going back. And as the Rebbe, when by the Fabrengen, it's not in the Likud Tzichas, but by the Fabrengen, the Rebbe said the words, They tasted what it means to go a step higher. And ooh, they saw what it means to be not only my Selikim, but also Michtav. The moment they lose that higher level, finished. It's nothing. In Kedusha, there's no such thing. In the world, yeah. You have gold, you had a diamond, you take out the diamond, you still have to do the gold, you have something. In business, a person has 50 billion dollars, came the crash, he lost a billion dollars, now he has 49 billion dollars. Is he considered a pauper? No, Baruch Hashem, 49 billion dollars, it's not the end of the world. In Kedusha, it doesn't work that way. In Kedusha, you constantly have to go up, higher and higher. The moment you reach the higher level, there's no such thing as going back. Going back, Shvira, is, is, is the end. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying. According to that, now we can understand what is the concept of the Luchas, that the message of the Luchas is the concept of constantly growing. If you don't grow, and if you do grow and you come back, that's broken. And that's the same thing that is by a Tzadik. What is a Tzadik? Let's look in our curriculum. A Tzadik is put together of two things. He has a goof and he has a neshama. He has a body and he has a soul, just like every Jew. But by a tzaddik, it's on a little bit on a higher level. And let's look in your quote number 13. In quote number 13, the Alter Rebbe talks about the body of a Jew, the guf. And soon we will understand what happened in the war. The Alter Rebbe says as follows. In Tanyan Perik Memtes, says the Alter Rebbe that when the Rebbe chose the Yidin, he didn't choose their, their, their because they have a neshama. No, 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 no. Uvonu vacharto mikolam veloshen. We say every day in davening that the Rebbe chose the Yidin. Where was the Pchira, says the Alter Rebbe? Who ha guf achumri. The Yidin have a guf, a body. It's not a pestama body. It's true that we see that other nations have it. But by the Yidin, it's Ubonu Bacharto. We're not going to go now into the whole sugya of the Pchir of Yidin. But the goof of the Yidin is something that the Rebishter created. It's something that, in theory, should be able to be self-sustained. And the Rebishter takes that body and he puts in a Neshama. Now, there's a difference between how a Jew deals with his Neshama and how a Tzaddik deals with his Neshama. The connection between the guf and the neshama. Look and you quote number 14. Here's where the Alter Rebbe discusses tzaddikim. There's a whole letter about to, uh, to a big tzaddik who passed away, the Blevitzu Bardich's son. And over there the Alter Rebbe discusses the chayim, the life of a tzaddik, the physical life of a tzaddik. Says the Alter Rebbe in Igeres HaKodesh, in Ige, the beer of, of the of Igeres Zoch, the, the number 27, the 27th letter over there in Tanya. Says the Altareb as follows: When a tzaddik lives here on earth, our average person is a very physical life. He has to eat, he davens, he goes, but it's all very physical. A tzaddik says the Altareb, no, 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 no. These are not the physical life that we see with our eyes. Everything looks so physical. He lives a spiritual life. Sheheim ahava v'yira, which is ahava v'yira, love for Hashem, fear for Hashem, etc. In other words, a regular person, his body and his, and his neshama are sort of two things which are interconnected. The neshama gives the life to the body and the body meanwhile does whatever he wants and a person can so-called so, so elevate himself if he wishes to. That is the average person. And sometimes he's more into it, sometimes he's less into it. We're all human. Yeah. 
A tzaddik? No. A tzaddik, his neshama and his body become so unique, so, so united, so interconnected, that this whole life of a tzaddik, although it looks physical, it is a spiritual one. And the Zohar stresses that even more. Look at your number 15. The Zohar in Chele Gimel. What does it say? Gufo de lehoin kadisha. The goof of the tzaddikim. Poshet becomes holy through their avoda, through their worship. And then nishmasa kodesh kadashim. Their um, neshama, their soul, is kodesh kadashim, holiest of holy. So we see over here that what is the concept of a tzaddik? A tzaddik, the guf, is holy. The neshama is an added thing. What happens when a tzaddik passes away? The neshama goes up. Right? What happens to the body? It dies. Why? The body is kadisha. The body was built by the Ebishter. Let it continue living. Not as good as before. But big deal. So the neshama is just an added thing because the good for Kadisha, the good by itself should be able to do it. Just like by the Luchas, it's Masa Likim. Comes the Rebbe and says, no. A tzaddik could have continued. It's true. He refined this goof so well that he could have continued going without the neshama. He was <laughs> close to it. What's the problem? The tzaddik, when he got the neshama, he became a higher level. Right? When you put a neshama onto a goof, it goes on a higher level. And the tzaddik, when he has a neshama, he could reach much higher levels. The moment the neshama leaves, he loses a little bit a part of the abishta. So although he just goes back a little lower, that now he is holy, but he's not as holy as he was before. In Kedusha, that doesn't work. In holiness, it doesn't. In, in, in Torah, that doesn't work. In Torah, you constantly have to grow. And the moment you grow, you have to continue growing further. If you step back or you stay in the same place, it's a problem. Shvira, it's a broken luchas. And this is the message that comes by Ayartzeit. When Ayartzeit comes around, what two things we could do? We could either say, Oy ve, he passed away, or no. What did he bring out the tzaddik? The tzaddik, when he passed away, he brought out that why did he pass away? Because since he sort of went down a level, there's no such thing as going down. You have to continue going. And that's why, look at your quote number 16. What does the Gemara say at the end of Brachas? Tzaddikim ein lohem menucha loy ba'elam hazeh veloy ba'elam abo. Because the moment that Misa happens, the moment that Histalkus happens, for whatever reason, the Rebishter takes out their Neshama, the Tzaddikim don't stop. They continue going. They don't have any Menucha. They don't have any rest. They continue going higher and higher and higher. And that's the reason why we say Kaddish every year, because the, 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 the Neshama always keeps on going higher and higher and higher. If that's the case, now we can understand what happened by war that the... Broken luchas go in front of the Eden. Why did the broken luchas go in front of the Eden? Why did the Eden go to war? Because they want to kill people? Because they want to become big? Chas v'shalem. No, 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 no. That's not the reason. What's the reason the Eden go to war? Let's look at your quote 17. Your last quote here. Let's look at, let's learn a halacha in Rambam. The Rambam says in Hilchus Malachim, Perik Hei Halacha Aleph. What does the Rambam say in the laws of kings? Ein ha-melech nilcham t'chila elam l'cham mitzvah. The, the king, when he goes out to war, he, there are two types of war. There's Melchemes Mitzvah, there's Melchem, which is a mitzvah, like when they had to go into Eretz Yisrael to capture Eretz Yisrael, or Melchemes Harishus, then there are other types of wars. Shenilcham im she'ar ho'amim, that he fights with other nations. Kedei leharchiv gevul Yisrael, in order to make broader the boundaries of the Yidden. To make greater the name of Hashem and the, the greatness of Hashem, so the name of Hashem becomes bigger in the world. In Eretz Yisrael, the Rebishter is known. Everybody knows that there's an Rebishter. Even when there's a king, the king, everyone knows, the Ein Olav Elo Hashem Alikov. The king, he constantly looks up to the Rebishter. He fears the Rebishter. The reason why Yidin fear a king, because the king fears Hashem. It's like a reaction. The king fears Hashem, they fear him. They do the same thing like he does. And then the Rabbim continues also over there in uh, the a few halachas before, in Perik Dal, the halacha Yud. What does the Rabbim say over there about the king? What should be his aim of the king, his tendency? Leharim das ho emes. He always has to raise the bar of the true das, of the true religion and laws. And to fill the world with righteousness. And to break the arm of the bad people. And to fight the wars of Hashem. So the whole concept of a war is what? Where the Yidin are going and saying something very simple. We already took care of our area. 
we are all, that's why only tzaddikim go. Tzaddikim, that they have done everything that they can do. That, but they want to continue growing. Their job is to take the world and turn it into a beautiful place for Hashem. So therefore they continue and go further and further and further and go to more and more and more. Who teaches them? Dad. They should, once they're tzaddikim, we did our part, beautiful, now let's go to sleep, let's go on vacation. Nah, who goes in front of them to war? Shivrei luchas, the broken luchas. What does the broken luchas teach? That a yid cannot stop where he is, and a yid constantly has to grow where he is, and a yid, chas v'sholem, even if he grows, if he steps up, if he comes a step back, oi, no, you can't do that. You constantly have to go and go. In other words, there's no such thing as complacency by in Taira. In Taira, we constantly have to grow non-stop. And this is what we learn from the yard site, the, what, the, what, the, what we just learned to Chumash, that the miss of Tzadikim, the passing of Tzadikim is just like the Shvira Saluchas, the positive. This is how we go to war. This is how we fight the Golas. What is the breaking of the Luchas? The breaking of the Luchas teaches us that you may be a Maiselikim, you may be the greatest guy. You don't grow? Forget it. It's nothing. You grew yesterday? That helps for yesterday. Today, you got to go further. And if you stop, or if God forbid you go a step back, it's nothing. And this is what Ayur Tzad teaches. When a Tzadik passes away, why did he pass away? Because... He went a step back. He lost the neshama. Ah, now he's a perfect goof. No, 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 no. That's nothing. He has to constantly grow. And that's why by a yard site, we get together again. What do we learn from the Bala yard site? Obviously, if it was a big, big tzaddik, that we constantly have to grow and grow and do more and more and more. And this is why by the Blevi Yitzchak, by the Rebbe's father, this becomes even stronger. Because we have tzaddikim that pass away, you know, after they did a lot of avoido here in this world. Reb Levi Yitzchok passed away, but he didn't just stand pass away. He passed away in Golos. He passed away in exile. Not only did he grow where he was a Rav, where he fought the Russians and everything, and he got hundreds and thousands of people to do Torah mitzvahs. That's an unbelievable growth. And he continued going. But now he reached even a higher level, and that is the level of Mesir Nefesh. The Reb Levi Yitzchok went on Mesir Nefesh. He gave up his life to be able to grow. And now there's two types of Mesir Nefesh. There's one type that they take a yid and they say, if you don't do Torah mitzvahs, if, if you want to do the Torah, we're going to kill you and finish. That's one Mesir Nefesh. Then there's another Mesir Nefesh being in jail for years and going through constant Mesir Nefesh. That is the highest level of Mesir Nefesh, as we discussed in the other shiurim when they discussed the concept of Mesir Nefesh. And therefore, when a day like Chaf of, when it comes to the yard site of somebody like Rebrev Yitzchak and Bichlal Tzadikim, we, there's one message only, and that is constant growth, no complacency. There's a beautiful video the, uh, from, from Jem, where they have different pieces from the Rebbe about this constant of growth. It, 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 you really should watch it. There's one story which over there, there's a group from the UJA that they came to the Rebbe and they told the Rebbe, you know, it was, uh, that uh, in honor of, I believe it was the Rebbe's birthday or something else, they decided to give to Lubavitch a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> you look on the video, they're so proud of themselves. They're giving the Lubavitch a quarter of a million dollars. And the Rebbe looks at them and says, and you expect me to be content with a quarter of a million dollars. Only the Rebbe could do that. Only a person who lives with the concept of constant growth. Someone comes and tells you he's giving you a quarter of a million dollars. Of course, you would say, oh, thank you. No, what's that thank you? A quarter of a million? No. If you could give a quarter of a million, that means you could give a half a million. And a half a million, you could give 10 million. What kind of business is a quarter of a million? There's another story. <laughs> there was a certain group of Chsidim with the Rebbe that came to visit the Rebbe. And the one who runs the, that the group happens to be a very, very smart guy, a, a diplomat. And he knew that before he comes to the Rebbe, he has to do his homework. What are the things that the Rebbe likes? So he would be able to tell the Rebbe that this is what they do. <laughs> so they all introduce themselves. And then this Mankal, this uh, guy in charge, tells the Rebbe, you know that we have uh, Koilulim. Oh, the Rebbe says, yeah, very good. And then he tells the Rebbe that the Koilul gives out every year a kovitz, a journal 
on Taita, if, you know, uh, articles on Taita that the Yungalai, that the guys in the Kohl will write down. Because he knows that the Rebbe loves to see journals of Taita coming out as much as possible. So he says that they give out a Kohl, the Kohl gives out once a year a Kavitz. And he was sure that I was going to say, oh, very nice, very good. <laughs> I remember when that happened. And the Rebbe turns to him and says, ah, what? So by us, we know that when the Rebbe says, ah, don't repeat the same thing because you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna mess yourself up. Make sure you count your words when you say that when you repeat it to the Rebbe. So he obviously repeated to the Rebbe. You know, we give out every year a kavitz, a journal. The Rebbe says, a kailal? Ain molayor? Only once a year? In other words, he thought he's coming, you know, oh, we're great guys, we give out a kavitz. The Rebbe says, no such thing. There was never, I don't recall ever a time that someone should tell the Rebbe how much he did. Unbelievable. And the Rebbe would always say, I don't understand. Why did you do only this? Why didn't you do also that? The Rebbe always more and more and more. Because that is the message of a war. We are in a war now. Golos is a war. We have to constantly go more. I remember, that if you look it up in the uh, encounters with the, you know, that they are on the Gem videos. And over there with the beautiful, with the Rabbi Evan Yisrael, Adin Steinzalt, Evan Yisrael. And he says over there that he had so many projects and he just couldn't handle them all. It was just impossible for him. So who's he going to turn to? He turns to the Rebbe and he wrote to the Rebbe that he has all of these projects. He says it's impossible for him to do. And uh, the Rebbe should just tell him which one he should cut out. <laughs> that was a mistake of his life <laughs> by writing such a letter to the Rebbe. And he wrote to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe told him, not only you should do all of these things, but the Rebbe added <laughs> to do some more stuff. And he explained yeah, and he explained it in physics, that when you put a certain amount of earth in a box, and then you press it, and then nothing more goes in. No, that's not true. It all depends how you press, what you use to press. The more pressure you give and the stronger pressure, you can put in more and more. The question is if you want to press. The question is if you want to push. And he says, and the Rebbe, when he asked from others, he demanded of himself even more than what he demanded of others. And this is the bottom line. We are like on an escalator. Escalator going down and we're trying to go up. If we go the same speed as the escalator, we're standing in one place, so we're not getting anywhere. We have to go faster than the escalator. If Chas Shalom, we stop even for a moment, we start going down. Comes Rebbe Yitzchak, comes the yard site, come the Shivrei Luchas, the broken Luchas, and they teach us, if you don't grow, if you're complacent, ain't Baham Mamish, it's nothing. What do we have to do? Constantly grow. And when the Rebishter sees that this is what we want to do, that we want to constantly grow, we want to reach the highest levels possible, the Rebishter gives us all the brachas in the world. Your guide to Motsasu, the Rebishter gives all the brachas possible. When he shows that we're not complacent, the Rebishter is not complacent, and eventually we've managed to reach the highest level. What is the highest level of Yidden? to come to the ultimate goal, the Geula HaMittis Vashlema Al Yedei Mashiach Tzitkeinu. The ultimate Geula, which we're going to go out of Golos, and then we will finally see how it was worth it. All our work in Golos, because now we're coming to the most beautiful time in life, when we're actually going to see the Luchos, and Moshe Rabbeinu, and all the Tzadikim, and the Beis Amikdash Hashlishi, and all I can finish off with is, comes now the Yartzat of Reb Yitzchak, that's all we have to take with us. Let's continue growing more and more, higher and higher, until we reach the Geula Shlema, and we're going to have the most beautiful brachas from the Eibishten to get us going there, and we will get there very, very soon. Behatzlach Arabah.